All right. Good evening and welcome to the October 26th, 2023 regular meeting of the San Diego Community Power Board of Directors. I am Joel Agava, Chair of the Board and the Representative for the City of San Diego. We welcome to mem welcome members of the public, the Community Power staff, and the board members for joining us this person this uh, afternoon. And apologies for those of you participating remotely. We had to wait till a few additional board members showed up, but now we're underway. So I will call the October 26, 2023 regular meeting of the Board of Directors of San Diego Community Power to order. Kimberly, will you please call the roll? Yes, City of San Diego Representative. Lacaba, present. County of San Diego Representative. Imperial Beach Representative. Aguirre here. Did you see it? Yes. I'm, excuse me, Mr. Chair. If the members that are attending virtually could just announce the reason why they're attending virtually for just cause, and if there are any um, members that are 18 years or older in the room with them, and yes, if so, course. what their relationship is. Thank you. I am participating in today's meeting remotely under recent amendments to the Brown Act due to a contagious illness that prevents me from participating in person. There is not someone 18 or older in the room with me. Thank you. Imperial Beach representative. I mean, wait, that's right. Yeah. No, La Mesa representative. Jack Shu here. National City representative. Here, Mr. Chairman, I am participating in today's meeting remotely under recent amendments to the Brown Act due to, uh, due to an illness that prevents me from participating in person. There is not someone 18 or older in the room with me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chula Vista representative. Mayor McCann here. And Sunitas representative. Kinsey here. We have a quorum. All right, thank you, Kimberly. So please uh, stand if you're able for the Pledge of Allegiance and face the flag. And over your heart, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Kimberly, that we have a point. So next up is special presentations and introductions. We'll start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge this meeting is taking place on the land of the original inhabitants of the greater San Diego region. A land acknowledgement is a critical step towards working with native communities to create meaningful partnerships and inclusion in the stewardship and protections of their cultural resources and homelands. Let's take a moment to honor these ancestral grounds that were the traditional lands of the Kumaye. All right, with that, we will welcome, as now, our tradition of welcoming new members to the Community Power Team. And we we'll want to give you an opportunity to come up and say a few words about yourself. Why don't we start with Ashley Rodriguez? new at Local Government Affairs Manager, and Christopher Stevens, Procurement Manager. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ashley Rodriguez. I am the new Government Affairs Manager for San Diego Community Power. Uh, I come from the nonprofit sector. I've mostly been working in resource development and community engagement with a through line on equity, civic education, and access to information. Oh, I was also say where I'm from, right? I'm a NorCal native, but I've been here for about 17 years. Made San Diego my home. Good evening, SDCP Board of Directors. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Chris Stevens. I am the newly uh, hired procurement manager at our organization. I come to the organization with electric gas utility experience, as well as um, uh, CCA and public agency experience. And uh, I have family in Encinitas, and so this mission is important to me. Thank you. Uh, I'm a Los Angeles native, and uh, I'm driving back and forth right now, so it's yeah. a bit of a driving. So I'm hoping to find something closer to work soon. Thank you so much for the opportunity again. All right. Welcome, Ashley and Chris. Great organization, great hires. And then I believe uh, Tim Treadwell is participating remotely. Yes, good evening. Uh, I'm Tim Treadwell. I'm joining the programs team. Um, 
actually have a pretty long connection to San Diego. I was stationed there in 1998 on the East Coast. Um, after I finished my enlistment, um, I went to grad school and returned in uh, 2009, where I worked at the Center for Stable Energy, um, owned a home in La Mesa, and my second daughter was born there. Um, I left the region again in 2016, and I've been living in Portland since, um, most recently working for uh, Portland General Electric. So I bring utility experience and program management experience, and I'm really excited to join the team and kind of take that inside utility knowledge and uh, bring it to the organization and help deliver value to, to customers in the region um, and using DERs to kind of lower our, our cost of service and, and deliver value. Welcome on board, Tim. Thank you. And Aaron Liu. Good afternoon, Board of Directors and SDCP team. I'm the new Race and Strategies Analyst. Super happy and super excited to be here. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles. I attended college at University of California, San Diego. I left after that to my graduate studies, uh, which took me to San Francisco for some um, experience at the Public Utilities Commission. After that, I came back to San Diego. I'm super excited to stay here working with the city on utility building management, as well as formation of the CC at that. After that, I transitioned to San Diego and Gaps Electric, only working on both forecasting and original procurement. And I'm super happy to be back here, kind of where uh, a lot of my work started. And I'm looking forward to working with everyone here and making the organization better. Welcome on board, Aaron. I'll note for the record that our vice chair, Lawson River, has joined us. And with that, we'll go on to the agenda. So do we have any items to be added, withdrawn, or reordered on the agenda? No, we do not. So next, we'll go to non-agenda public comment. I want to note that written public comments submitted before the board meeting were emailed to all directors prior to the board meeting and will be posted on the website at the beginning of the meeting. Kimberly, do we have any non-agenda public comments? No, we do not. Right. Right along. We'll move on to the consent calendar. And for the record, I think I skipped last time, but we have the approval of the September 28th meeting minutes, the treasurer's report for period ending August 31st, an update on programs, an update on power services, an update on human resources, an update on customers' operation, me, operations, update on marketing and public relations, update on community advisory committee, update on legislative and regulatory affairs. We also have approval of a SEND analytics pilot extension agreement for PowerSim pilot support services, approval of a 10-year 6-megawatt resource adequacy agreement with EnterSmart, Approval of the San Diego Community Power new alternate to the La Mesa Environmental Sustainability Commission. Number 13, approval of amended and restated engagement letter with Keys and Fox for legal services for power procurement through December 31st, 2023. Are there any directors that would like to pull an item from the consent calendar? Not seeing any. I will make the motion uh, to approve the consent yeah. calendar. We're going to go public comment. Oh, okay. And then we'll go to you. Uh, do we have any public comment? No, we do not. Uh, okay. Mayor McCann? I would be happy to uh, make the motion to approve the consent calendar with all items uh, 1 through 13. So moved. I'll second the motion. We have a motion by Member McCann, uh, second by Member Kinsey. And because we do have people participating uh, remotely, we'll have to do a roll call. Kimberly, please call the roll. Director Aguirre, how do you vote? Yes. <clears throat> Director McCann, how do you vote? Aye. Director Shu, how do you vote? Aye. Director Hinzi, how do you vote? Yes. Director Yamani, how do you vote? Yes. Vice Chair Lawson Reamer, how do you vote? Yes. Chair LaCava, how do you vote? Yes. Motion carries with all directors voting yes. Thank you, Kimberly. Now move on to the uh, discussion items. Item 14, an update on fiscal year and 2023 financial audit progress report. And I will turn this over to Dr. Eric Washington, present this item. And for the members, the auditors, Vicente and Brinker will be available remotely if needed. 
Good evening, and thank you. <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Chair Kaba, directors. Uh, this item of the progress report of our audit for fiscal year in 2023 is a receiving file item on our agenda this evening. Uh, next slide, please. This item is to provide the board of directors with an update on the progress we've made or the audit which began in the month of July with the board's approval of an amendment to the professional services agreement with our uh, accounting and audit firm. Fast forward to this month, um, we've made significant progress toward the completion of the audit, uh, having it reviewed at the Finance and Risk Management Committee at this month's meeting and now providing uh, to the board of directors with the intent of delivering the final audit report during the month of November to both the Finance and Risk Management Committee uh, as well as the board uh, in the month of November. Next slide, please. Our audit firm, Crescenti and Brinker, we have members of the audit team with us this evening. Uh, joining us is Brett Bradford, our audit partner with Crescenti and Brinker, and Alejandra Schaefer, our a uh, supervisor on the project. Combined, they have over 24 years experience in auditing public and government entities like community choice aggregators, similar to San Diego Community Power. Uh, with that, uh, Brett, I know that you're attending remotely. I will pass it to you to provide comments with regard to the status of the audit uh, report. Brett. Thank you, Dr. Washington. Uh, as you can see the slide before you, um, we are near completion um, and we have no issues to report at this time. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So we're expecting a positive outcome within the next week or so of the process, but happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Brett. Uh, with that, Chair, I will pass it back over to you. All right, thank you. Uh, Kimberly, do we have any public comment on this item? No, we do not. So with that, I'll turn over the board members. And if there is no objection, we'll just receive and file this, but I wanna give you an opportunity at this early stage. Uh, I just wanna confirm you've received all the information you've requested. <laughs> yes, that's a question for me, thank you, yes. Yeah. Uh, and you haven't been encouraged to change your findings to a more favorable state? No, there, there's been no significant findings to discuss with management in that regard, so no. Okay. Well, certainly appreciate you giving us this early uh, advance notice of the status of the audit. Very much appreciate it. Very much appreciate your work, Dr. Wachtin, on this. So unless there's any objection, we'll just receive and file this item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Item 15, update on the Regional Energy Network, or RED, progress. I'll turn it over to Sheena Tran and Colin Santuli to present this item. And Laura Rothschild, our consultant from our consulting team, will be available remotely for any questions. So Sheena and Colin, when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Kava, and thank you, board. You already introduced uh, our guest on the line, Laura Rothfield, but I wanted to recognize her again. It should be available for questions if need be. Tonight, we're going to provide an update on the regional energy network and what we've been working on the last seven months. Uh, we have been, we brought the REN to you originally all the way back in May of 2022. When we first discussed this is an opportunity to serve uh, not only our customers, but the residents throughout San Diego County. Uh, we most recently brought an item to you in February, specifically of uh, this year, and we wanted to update you on what we've been working on since then. So first, a quick primer uh, for those who need it. The uh, REMS were introduced in 2012 as an opportunity by the Public Utilities Commission for a new model for administering energy efficiency programs. Uh, so this is in addition to programs that are already offered in the region by State, uh, statewide entities, as well as by our um, city of gas and electric. REN programs are not intended to duplicate existing energy efficiency programs, but are supposed to complement them. Um, and not only that, but also think about how they can be incorporated into other funding opportunities coming down from the federal government. 
Uh, as you can see here, we are the only populated region left in the state of California that does not have a REN. It was something we identified early uh, in our existence as an agency and uh, as trying to fill that gap. Uh, RENs are, again, they're authorized by the PUC and they're funded by a public purpose charge uh, via utility rates. So this is the same pot of funding uh, that funds SDGs, EE portfolio, and other public benefit programs. Hey, Tom, can I interrupt for a second? I kind of forgot my protocol. I always forget the notes I have or the notes you have. This is about a 30 minute presentation. Just want to let you know. Sorry for the interruption. Next slide. That means I should go faster to be rough. I just wanted to really prepare people. So. Good work. <laughs> we'll, we'll be uh, efficient. Good. So today, like I mentioned, we're going to cover what we have been working on the last six months since we last briefed the board. And mainly that'll be the uh, SD-REN governance structure and core values that we've developed, uh, the draft REN programs that we're here to present, as well as the extensive stakeholder engagement that we want to uh, share with you, and then the timeline and next steps for the REN. And that I'll pass it to Sheena Trent. Thanks, Joe. Good evening. Um, I'll get started with our structure and core values. So to provide background on the governance structure, um, starting in 2019, the CPC required that new rents represent at least two local government entities within its governance structure. And this was intended to effectuate the CPC's preference that rents be regional in nature. Um, the CPC leaves it up to new rents to propose a structure and describe it in the business plan application. So as we dug in and looked at the existing rents, um, we found that there's no one structure that fits all. Um, that works best for the region that it serves. So when coming up with our own objectives in developing a structure, we sought to achieve these three goals. First, that it complies with CPUC requirements. Two, it allows for the expeditious distribution of resources to underserved communities. And three, it includes a forum for ongoing regional discussions. So what we landed on is what you see here. Um, it includes an oversight and administration body, which is made up of SDCP and the second public agency. And I'll take this opportunity to announce um, San Diego County Office of Sustainability and Environmental Justice has signed on to be the second public agency for SDREN. Um, we're very excited to work together to offer programs throughout the county. Um, we believe that this structure to include all of San Diego County is the most inclusive approach for an SDREN. The responsibilities of this body will be to, as the name implies, provide overall SD-REN portfolio oversight and administration, which means providing vision and strategy, enacting program and overseeing future business plan development. Um, SDCP will be the lead program administrator, fulfilling all fiscal regulatory procurement and program management responsibilities. Um, there will be an advisory committee um, that will be made up of local and regional governments and CBOs and other public agencies, nonprofits, or JPAs that have a vested interest in energy reduction or energy efficiency, um, including our sister CCA, Clean Energy Alliance. Um, the responsibilities of the advisory committee will be to provide advisement on outreach, enrollment, or program elements to ensure successful implementation of the programs. And then lastly, there's the program operations team, um, and this body will oversee the day-to-day -day program activity and reporting, and will be consisted of program managers and third-party implementers. Um, and just like the other RENs coordinate with overlapping investor-owned utilities and statewide program administrators, SD-REN will coordinate with SDG&E and statewide program administrators that have energy efficiency offerings in our region. Um, coordination is critically important, and it's expected of all program administrators, um, and we would be no different than the IOUs and RENs throughout the state, in that we have, we'll have the shared goal of limiting customer confusion and maximizing benefits and services to customers. Um, and to do this, and upon CPUC approval, we plan to have formal sector-specific coordination, similar to how um, other RENs coordinate. Um, next slide, please. These are our three core values. Um, the first is focused on integrating a collaborative and purposeful investment in the region's underserved and hard to reach communities. 
The second value is focused on workforce development. So SD Ren will be committed to be a part of the solution and create opportunities locally and contribute to the needed expansion of the clean energy workforce in order to deliver on our regions and our state's objectives to transition to a clean energy economy. The third core value is to be a trusted local resource and coordinate on regional policy, partnerships, and programs. Um, we believe that SD Ren will be in a position to, to do this coordination. Um, next slide. Um, okay, so before I jump into the programs, I want to me mention um, there were several steps that we took to come up with the draft list of programs. So we first developed program priorities and goals. And in this step, we looked at um, and aligned ourselves with CPU's um, findings on RENs, including the ability to serve hard to reach customer segments. We conducted a market assessment on existing programs, and in this step, we reviewed other program administrators' business plans and portfolio applications, including a review of existing rents. Um, we conducted sector research, including analysis on a sector's potential and size, uh, program participation, and location of under-resourced communities. And following, we conducted extensive state engagement to receive input and feedback that Khan will go over in following slides. Um, from our market assessment, we found that the residential, commercial, and public sectors consume the highest amounts of electricity and have the biggest opportunities for savings. Um, so the programs that we developed um, will be gap filling and complementary to existing programs. And when we say gap filling, it's dependent on the program, um, but the gap could mean a gap in customer types or measures or gaps in delivery mechanisms. Um, okay, so. Here you'll see uh, the sectors. Uh, we have 11 proposed programs across five sectors shown here. We also have listed the target populations um, that the programs will aim to serve. Um, the business plan application covers eight years, starting in 2024 through 2031. And the initial four-year annual budget will range approximately from $25 million to $35 million, um, with residential, commercial, and public sectors allocated about 75% of the total budget. Um, in the following slides, I'll briefly go over the program type, and I'd be happy to answer any specific questions of the programs following the presentation. Um, I'd also like to mention that it is encouraged for program administrators to design programs to be able to stack with other funding sources. And for um, IRA funding specifically, we have plans to provide education and guidance for customers on how to take advantage of offerings, so similar to an application assistance. Um, our programs will be focused on underserved and hard to reach uh, communities. Um, underserved is defined as disadvantaged communities per Cal Empire screen, or low income communities as defined by the federal poverty level, or a community in which at least 75% of the public school students in the area are eligible to reach free or reduced price meals under the National School Lunch Program. Um, I also provide a definition of hard to reach, and that is defined as customers for customer premises in disadvantaged communities, or it can meet other criteria if the geographic criteria is not met. For example, if a residential or commercial customer is not located in a disadvantaged community, but other criteria uh, to be considered is that the primary language is something other than English, so it's not just geography based. Um, here, the workforce education and training programs are presented, and these programs are meant to support the long-term success of the energy efficiency market by providing education and training. Our programs will provide students, adults, and employers training and certification at no cost and connect participants with on-the-job training. Um, the expected budget allocation is about 20% of the overall portfolio budget. Next slide. The codes and standards program will assist permitting authorities streamline the permitting process by offering my technical assistance. Offerings include uh, a needs assessment, tools and templates, and educational workshops. This sector is allocated 5% of the portfolio budget. Next slide, please. Uh, there are two residential programs being offered, one for single family and one for multifamily properties and owners. The programs assist with identifying energy efficiency opportunities and installing measures leading to utility bill savings and improved indoor air quality. The expected uh, budget allocation is about 30% for this sector. Next slide. 
Commercial, uh, commercial programs are focused on small and medium-sized businesses and will offer technical assistance, energy efficiency measures, and facility assessments. The sector is allocated 30%. And then lastly, the public sector programs will assist public agencies throughout San Diego County identify and implement energy efficiency projects and the expected budget allocation here is about 50% of the overall portfolio budget. And with that, I'll hand it over to Colin. Thank you, Tina. The next slide, please. So we, we wanted to share that information with the board here and, and seek any feedback on if there's any desired direction changes in the either the sectors or the specific programs that we've identified. Uh, we have done extensive engagement in the region here, really throughout the state, and we're considering other REMs as well, uh, that led to these programs. Uh, but that being said, we still want to uh, are open to any feedback um, that you all have on the program types specifically. Our stakeholder engagement truly really for this started back when we were developing our community power plan. You all remember we identified the REM as one of the primary um, uh, funding opportunities for the region as a whole to bring uh, to identify uh, funding for uh, energy efficiency programs specifically for underserved communities. You can see here if we uh, the CBOs that we worked with, uh, MAC, the Project New Village, and those listed on the slide here were all part of our uh, community power plan engagement. Uh, those we've either uh, engaged with on the REN specifically or we're working to set up uh, briefings with them other CBOs and NGOs that we've talked with have been the San Diego Regional Climate Collaborative that we've had regular standing meetings with, as well as a climate action campaign and the San Diego Building Electrification Coalition. We've also been uh, having or uh, in constant conversation with local uh, regional public agencies. So in addition to our member agencies, you all here, we've been, uh, uh, we presented to the Clean Energy Alliance Board all the way back in January. We've been in conversations with uh, individual member agencies from that CCA as well. As well, we talked about the airport and the Port of San Diego and San Diego. Again, our attempt here is to show a truly regional effort to bring a REN to San Diego. Um, for brevity, I'll skip the rest of the entities on here, but uh, I will note that we've done specific sector engagement. As an example, the International Code Council, the San Diego chapter, those are the folks who will be using that codes and standards program specifically. As we're uh, working with, we'll be eventually the end users of these programs to make sure that they be accessible and, and worthwhile. Next slide. Next slide. So what, where we're looking now is we've talked about where what we did the last six months here and uh, ahead of us the next two months, uh, we will present today, we will finish up our engagement over the next few weeks and we'll be continuing to compile letters of support um, once we uh, receive some final feedback, both from the board and from uh, the, our final meetings, we'll need to bookend our engagement and really start to focus on completing that uh, business plan, which is a, a formal application of the Public Utilities Commission. That's a, a significant lift that we are hoping to complete and bring back to this board in December uh, for approval to submit that to the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, assuming we meet that deadline, we'll then enter a public process of the application that the PUC will manage. That can take anywhere from um, six to 12 months, um, during which we'll be uh, optimistically working on implementation plans and whatnot in hopes that uh, REN is approved. And that concludes our presentation. Happy to take any questions. All right, well, thank you both. Uh, for any public comment? Yes, Serena Pelka. Serena, um, you can speak, you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, hello, this is Serena Pelka from Climate Action Campaign. We're just calling in to share our excitement and support for the formation of the Regional Energy Network. SDCP continues to show its commitment to customer equity and to programming that supports energy efficiency, electrification, local energy generation, and workforce development for its customers. And we definitely see uh, the REN as a really strong path to continue to do so. We're also particularly thrilled to see that the REN will cover the region in its entirety. So overall, we're just really happy to share our ongoing support for the formation of the REN and really look forward to the application submittal to the CPUC in December. Thank you. There are no additional public comments. All right, I'll turn it over to the board. This is a receiving file. So if there is no objection, we'll simply receive the file of the update. Let's turn it over to vice chair. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I actually just have a bunch of questions and comments, but 
first, I just want to say I'm so excited. I think this is fantastic. Um, yeah, I just think this is so fantastic. Um, it's great work. I think it's an incredibly important initiative. I'm really glad uh, that the county can be a partner um, in this. And um, just I think you guys have done a tremendous job. So I, I am really, really excited. I just had um, a couple of thoughts or questions kind of on your stakeholder engagement and a couple other uh, kind of questions. So if we wouldn't mind if we could go back to the stakeholder slide. Um, yeah, it just, uh, was this, is this an exhaustive list or are there sort of, are there others that are, or you, other folks that you've engaged with that listed here? This would be almost an exhaustive list, but uh, yeah, I think it would be an exhaustive list. Okay, great. So I just wanted to kind of identify a few entities that I thought would be really helpful. Um, so for example, there's some um, Main Street associations um, in some of our smaller cities someone on this board who can speak to more authority around those than I can, uh, but I think are really close um, and really have their ear to the ground on the needs of, of small businesses. Um, and that's, you know, there's there's Encinitas has one, um, Salon of Beach has one, and these are the 101 associations. Um, and there's also a North County Business Chamber, and none of these are, are listed here. So um, I think it would be probably very helpful. And these are organizations that do have really strong uh, small business members. Um, and I think if we're kind of looking at programming that is gonna impact small businesses, I think it would be really helpful. Um, other thoughts on some engagement. There are other impacted labor unions that are not mentioned here. So um, I think there's probably some more work to be done on um, other, other labor unions who do work that's relevant to all of this um, that I'm happy to kind of continue that conversation. But I can, I can think of at least three that aren't listed here that that should be engaged. Um, so we can talk about that. Um, and then the other only other thought was, um, you know, I know you mentioned you talked to the, you know, these cities as whole as a whole. Um, but I'm curious, have you done a kind of targeted outreach to the city council members that represent the districts that are most likely that have the communities and constituencies that are most likely to be uh, kind of immediately impacted or served by the programming? We haven't done any engagement specifically with elected officials um, of certain districts, no. That, I mean, it probably wouldn't be my district, but I do think there would be a value to, to having some of those conversations to the extent that, you know, you have a good sense of what the communities are that are most likely to, to be, you know, Im impacted or benefited, um, you know, that those seem like useful conversations to have, um, you know, as programs are developed, but even on the, on the front end. Um, and there were also, I think, a couple, um, yeah, like uh, I, I, the what about um, the the our uh, like uh, APCD? Have you engaged with them at all? They have a, like they have an environment like an EJ coordinator, so that sort of that's like another person that might be a useful uh, point of contact. So I don't want to. I just there. I noticed that there were some folks a little bit missing from this particular engagement. So. Thank you for the discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, Member Enzi. Thank you. I too am really proud that we're moving towards filling that gap for San Diego that we can join the rest of California with um, an up and running brand. Um, I had a question about will about the, the payment for this. Will ratepayers see an additional charge on their bills and will it be specified that that's what it's for? This uh, REMS are funded through the public purpose charge. And so that's a um, a group's charge that is funded through the rates. And so um, it will depend on other programs using the public purpose charge as to whether an increase would happen specifically, but you ne would never see a REN indicated on your bill. It's all lumped in with energy efficiency programs that other entities are uh, running, as well as other public purpose benefit or public benefit programs. Got it. So it would be it would be part of the bill, but it wouldn't be broken out in its separate category. Correct. OK. Um, and then I just had a few uh, additions to stakeholder engagement and just wanted to know if we considered them like school districts, for example, seems like a really good place for us to be able to exercise the programs. Um, UCSD and then maybe some of our bigger health networks, uh, bigger medical providers. And that's it. Right. Thank you. And member Shu. I have some questions first, and I'm really happy that we're moving forward on this and uh, catch up with the rest of the state and have you. Um, 
So you mentioned uh, using Cal Environmental Screening maps. There are many maps in Cal Environmental Screening. Is there a specific one that you're referencing to? Uh, Cal Environmental Screening 4.0. Yeah, but there are different maps within Calvin screening for different uh, uh, grouping. There's a general one, and you know we, we've all seen them, or not all of us, but we recall there's red areas and orange and, and yellow and green, but they're also for different uh, types of uh, pollutants and conditions. Is there a general one, or is it just just using the general one or specific one? Of the general one is what we're great. So, um, so that's my question there. Um, so I also happen to be on, you know, we're served on SANDAG and, and uh, APCD. And those two entities more recently are then also um, by policy looking at the kind of screening maps, particularly those in, in uh, for both SANDAG uh, and uh, APCD looking at those areas that are most impacted. And specifically for um, uh, Sandag, we're now looking at uh, not only the Forsyth Community Plan, uh, which includes in parts of South County, uh, but also using the county formato screen at two point uh, two point five, but um, uh, diesel particular matter. So these are particular matters, the worst of the worst. Uh, and interesting enough, there are um, census tracts throughout the county. That are above seventy five percent percent So in the upcoming regional plan, we're trying to reduce health impacts in those areas. Which comes to my other question is, uh, in terms of overall values and goals, it, it seems like they're economic in nature and trying to reach certain you know, populations and efficiency. Is there any thought of including um, health impacts? Is that is that precluded from program? That is reducing health impacts within those areas because the Cal Environmental Screening, that's a major factor. That's why those areas are red. So the question, um, as I understand it, we'll be using the Cal Environmental Screen 4.0, which includes uh, all the different indicators, not just uh, the health impacts, but the economic as well. So it should factor in health impacts um, or like uh, heavily impacted by environmental conditions, those areas of our region. So that could be factored into where the programs will be targeted when looking when using the Cal virus screen. But as Sheena mentioned, it's not just a geographic basis. The, the PUC defines hard to reach and disadvantaged communities and underserved communities with a number of different criteria, some of which are income based. Some of them use the disadvantaged community maps and others are, um, as Sheena mentioned, like the certain percentage of families who are on um, free and uh, discounted lunch programs. So it, it won't be uh, the RAM program will not be focused on certain geographic areas. They'll be targeted to certain underserved communities and underserved uh, residents and businesses. Sure. I guess in situations like that, uh, certainly when we deal with the greenhouse gas emission reductions, we start calling these health benefits uh, co-benefits. So though it may not be directly uh, <clears throat> tied to the goal of the program, uh, that uh, if you reduce asthma, for example, uh, and cancer, uh, because you did something to help energy efficiency, that becomes a co-benefit. Cool and sometimes the value of that is much more than than uh, how much you may have saved that family's uh, household income expenditures. So I would encourage looking at that as well, as as um, particularly if you're going into those communities that are in the red, <laughs> that let's say if you use the uh, diesel particular matter map, and maybe even work with Sandag to figure out how the programs you're developing can coincide with Sandex goals of improving health impacts in these communities. Because one of the ways we're hoping to do that, and APCD is trying to do that, is to um, bring in um, electric uh, medium and heavy duty trucks. And one of the impediments for that in those communities is um, getting better electrification and in terms of uh, charging stations. So that goes to your commercial side of your program. And if we can coincide with the efforts of APCD and SANDAG, we could really have another way to incentivize and help those communities um, and, and build the, uh, the co-benefits of the program. Um, and I, I think I also would say that there are other groups that you may want to talk to uh, uh, that really share the same uh, uh, 
same concerns that you have in, in your program. Um, the goal of the Portside Community Plan, that cert, is to have 80% um, paying trucks in the Portside Community areas by, I guess, 2031. They have a very steep guideline. That means those trucks going into those parts in the National City and Pedro need to be 80% electric within uh, you know, eight years or seven years. So that means electrification will be really important. And if we can help those industries and businesses run those kinds of trucks in those areas, that would really be helpful. Um, and I, I could see this really be helping. Um, and of, of course, those areas are, if you might map and account for my screen, it's, it's the reddest red it's, it's in the 99. Yeah. So I hope you can consider that in working on this because it, it, it would make this program blend in with what other uh, regional agencies are doing to try to reduce impacts in those communities. And, and lastly, um, when you deal with electrification of households in those communities, uh, that would be great too. So since we now know how dangerous uh, my gas soap is. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just to uh, add a couple of questions. I think for context, um, when you do the stakeholder engagement, the purpose of that was to kind of create a three-tiered program. The allocation of how, what percentage of the budget was developed. Was that kind of the purpose of the engagement process? It really kind of ran the gamut because like I mentioned the engagement ramp started uh, earlier this year. We originally went to the San Diego Regional Climate Collaborative. They convened a group of public agencies, and we talked about the very beginning, which is the governance structure and how we should be structured. So we talked about governance structure, and we, uh, we also got feedback on the core values. And then uh, I would say our programs, most of that was driven by, the initial list was driven by the market assessment that was uh, that Tech and Ashina described, that Tech uh, administered for us. And then once we had the draft program programs, we then did engagement on those specific programs and uh, getting feedback on if they felt um, the programs would fill the gaps that, that our research suggested that they would. Okay. And then thinking ahead, I had when the CPC does approve this, if we know they will, because you're doing such fantastic work, um, will you be engaging with other stakeholders as kind of a bridge to uh, underserved communities and individuals where community power may not have the relationships, may not have the trust quite yet? And you'll use other um, third parties to help you bridge that gap. Um, yes, definitely. And I, that is the purpose of uh, creating an advisory committee yeah. to bring in CEOs from um, you know areas outside of our service territory. Okay. Um, yeah, I think the I think the stakeholder engagement, in addition to what our members said, was very good. Um, and I think the key, that's certainly what we found in the city of San Diego is we as a government is not always well received, uh, even when we have good things to offer and having more trusted CBO or um, uh, individual organization can often help uh, bring those good things that you're trying to do. So, um, but that's your away, it sounds like. So, but thank you both in the program's team. Uh, this certainly is the heart of our goal to engage the community and provide savings energy and efficiencies back to our customers. Thank you for picking this up, recognizing this and, and moving this forward. Clearly a lot of work um, and very much appreciated. And uh, we'll uh, we'll put the champagne on ice and <laughs> get ready to bring it out and give us the good news. So again, this is a receiving file unless there's any objections by the board members. I don't have an objection, but just one thing to add on the topic that you brought up of the advisory committee. I do hope that we can compensate people on the advisory committee because if they're offering time and insight for us to make sure we're doing our programs really well, that that's part of what we're budgeting to do as, as the brand rolls out. Thank you. Uh, good reminder, Member Kinsey. Okay, with that, um, seeing no other comments or questions, not seeing anybody remote. So we'll now move on to item 16, which is approval of the net billing tariff. And to begin, I'll turn it over to Mr. Clark to introduce this item. Thank you, Chair LaCava, members of the board, members of the public. I just wanted to spend a quick moment here 
uh, recognizing the team here at San Diego Community Power. Uh, review the following two agenda items uh, on net billing tariff and net energy metering uh, as a comprehensive package of adjustments to seek to balance not only the needs of our customers equitably, but also our continued support of the battery and solar industries here in our communities. Our goal in support of these priorities was to develop a thoughtful, comprehensive, and progressive set of data-driven packages uh, or a package of changes. Um, and this process has highlighted San Diego Community Power as an innovative leader on this topic, not only here in the region, but statewide and in some regards nationally, as we endeavored through this stakeholder engagement. Uh, the team has reached out to a number of industry and equity-driven stakeholder groups and to an organization we have gathered support on our approach. And finally, this portfolio uh, is a prime example of how our team here at San Diego Green Power works across areas of subject matter expertise. These efforts have had uh, sincere input from our power services team, our programs team, public affairs, customer accounts, data and analytics, and many others. And with that, I'm uh, quite proud to hand over uh, the mic to both and Nelson. Uh, to take it from here, and then we'll have Lucas uh, batting cleanup uh, on this subject. Thank you again. And I believe you have about a 15 minute presentation. Or less. Or less. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. Yeah, I'll be very brief here and just echo uh, Jack's comments on how big of a team effort it was in this back to uh, programs and uh, some across the board. Um, we are up here presenting with the program team, there was much more in the program team, you know, as Jack mentioned. Uh, definitely want to uh, give credit mm -hmm. to. Nelson Lavelli, who has been our lead on this the agency, and we would not have the, the package and the tariff in front of you were not for him and the rest of the team uh, who put it forward. So, uh, we are going to present net billing tariff, first of all, what it is and why we're proposing to adopt it. Uh, we will talk about how we think, like Jack said, this is a very data driven and also is the most progressive uh, net billing tariff uh, and really on site generation uh, package in the state, um, specifically through what we call generation adders. And then we'll also talk uh, briefly about uh, net surplus compensation and how we're going to deal with that or proposing to deal with that under the net billing tariff um, uh, structure. And with that, I will pass it to Nelson. We'll go from here. Great. Uh, so as you saw in the, in the previous slide, there's a couple of uh, there's a few things that we want to cover with you all. Um, just to give you a, just a brief overview of what net billing tariff is, talk about why we want to adopt it, um, and then also talk about uh, some of the generation adders that we are proposing, and finally the net surplus compensation piece. Um, so to start off uh, on what is net billing tariff, I think uh, this is a, a question that everyone's been asking because it's a relatively new term. There's also another term for it um, from the utilities called the solar billing plan. So there's a lot of acronyms uh, being thrown around, but uh, essentially, net billing is the next evolution in the set of rules in California for how customers who have on-site generation uh, are compensated for that electricity that they generate and export to the grid. Uh, MBT, as we call it, or net billing tariff, um, will replace or is replacing net energy metering uh, for how customers are compensated for that electricity. Um, it is this... MBT is for all new customers that interconnected on or after April 15th of this year. Um, and I think it's important to note that this does not currently impact our NEM customers. So as Lucas uh, mentioned, uh, has in his staff report, um, we have uh, close to 176,000 uh, accounts, uh, NEM customers currently. I think we should be very proud of that. Um, those customers will not be impacted by this uh, net billing tariff. Um, until they complete their 20 year legacy period um, that they, they have. So if we go to the next slide, um, just a quick background on how we got to net billing tariff. Um, so the all of this really started when the California Public Utilities Commission or the CTC uh, adopted uh, NEM 2.0 as they called it, Net Energy Engineering 2.0. Um, they they decided that at that point in time, they were going to adopt it. And then a few years later, they were going to do an evaluation on that, um, which they called the look back study. Uh, so this study uh, determined that as the program currently stands, NEM is not really cost effective uh, and it's leading to higher rates for customers, uh, for electric customers uh, throughout the entire state. 
Um, we're not necessarily here to debate the merits of the study that went through the whole its own public process with the CPC, uh, but we just wanted to show that to you all here. Um, as a result of that study, the CPC determined um, that a new tariff was needed, and so they solicited ideas from interested parties, from stakeholders, as well as they commissioned energy and an environmental economics um, called E3 to draft a kind of white paper with some ideas for what that potential tariff would look like. So um, after various hearings, after testimony, briefings, proposals, you can imagine all of the movements that go on within the CPC, they finally adopted uh, the net billing tariff um, in December of last year to be implemented uh, December of this year. So they gave the utilities time to update their billing systems um, to be implemented um, in a few months. Next slide. So as a result of that, um, of them going through this extensive process, the, the goal here was really to try and balance the cost uh, of the, the solar systems, of, of the incentives across all customers and to ensure equity. So they were, they were trying to balance these costs while also simultaneously encouraging a sustainable growth of distributed generation and in the industry as a whole. So they really designed uh, this, this new tariff as a way to uh, not only do that, but also to help promote the adoption of battery storage. So that was one of the things that they found was that the, the current NEM program doesn't really send the proper price signals and the market signals um, to adopt uh, battery storage. And so they, they addressed it through the net billing tariff. Um, and it is intended uh, to better reflect the needs of the grid uh, and to and again, to send that kind of price signals for grid resiliency as well. Um, so that's where we're at uh, in terms of the background of net billing tariff. If we go to the next slide. Um, where we're at now is asking, uh, is recommending and asking for approval of the net billing tariff um, and to use uh, SC Genie's avoided cost calculators um, for compensation. So our analysis, we did a really in-depth analysis, um, and I want to give a, a big shout out to our data analytics team, Lucas and Ryan and everyone on, on that team, um, because they, they really dug into this. They did uh, uh, all the forecasting needed uh, to think about how many, uh, to anticipate how many customers we could potentially see over the next three years. Looking at various scenarios, what I'm um, looking like on a low growth scenario, a mid growth scenario, or like a business as usual, looking through all of that, uh, modeling all of the different rates and ensuring that the compensations were, um, were accurate. And what we found is that if we were to adopt NDT as compared to just extending the current NEM program, all our customers, all SDCP, would save over $20 million over the next three years. Uh, by adopting NBT. So that is a, a significant savings that then could be passed on to our customers um, through either rate stabilization, rate savings um, that we could provide back to our solar customers to encourage adoption of solar through nurse um, or through customer programs such as the battery incentive program that we can discuss um, later on um, in the presentation. Um, so that is the, the savings that we're seeing there. Um, and why one of the reasons we are coming uh, to you with a recommendation to adopt NBT. If we go to the next slide. Um, we also got our power services team um, involved in this, in this endeavor. Um, they looked at uh, the avoided cost calculator rate for SDG. So they, they did an in-depth analysis looking at all of the documentation that was available to ensure that what was proposed, what was done was uh, thorough, that it was professional, that it was uh, adequate, that it was everything you can imagine. Um, and really what they were trying to do, determine is whether their rates, the ACC rates, were a, a sufficient proxy for our own load curve. Um, and what they determined was that it was. And so the reason staff is here recommending that we use SEG's ACC rates or avoided cost calculator rates, I should have mentioned that earlier, um, is the, for ease of simplicity and an already complicated program. Um, so by um, having the ACC rates be the same across the, um, the two sides of the equation, the distribution and the generation side, it makes it easier for our, our customers to really, uh, the solar industry and our customers to really try and understand this quite complicated um, structure. As you can kind of see here in this example, 
Um, these are an example of the ACC rates where the price that a customer is going to get compensated for the energy they export to the grid varies not only by hour throughout the day, but also by month. So uh, as you can see here, there, uh, it, the prices vary widely. There's a couple of times or a couple of hours um, in the months of uh, September, uh, August and September, where uh, prices can get really expensive. And so that this is the price signal that is being sent to the market to adopt storage, store that energy that's being generated, and then discharge it during these really uh, prime or peak hours. Um, so that's, that's where we're at with the avoided cost calculators. So we go to the next slide um, and a couple of more. Uh, so we also wanted to look at um, providing a generation adder. So if we go to the next slide, the reason being is that when the, the CPUC was establishing and adopting this net billing tariff, um, one of their primary goals was to ensure that all new customers that were installing generation um, would see a payback period uh, on their investment of nine years. Um, what ended up happening is that they determined that due to the high rates within the sdg &E service territory, um, all new systems were already seeing a payback period that was below nine years. However, that was not true for the other two utilities. And so what they, in order to achieve that nine year payback period, they ended up providing um, adders to those to customers in those utilities. Um, and we kind of a, took a look at that and said, you know, we could do better. Um, we should do better as, a, as, an, as an agency. Um, and so with that in mind, if we go to the next slide, we, we started this, uh, this process of trying to determine what um, generation adders we could provide as SDCP. Um, and we were really intentional here with, with our adders. We didn't just want to have it be any number that we picked from the wind. We really set out these goals initially to make sure that our tariff was competitive um, to mm -hmm. any of the other tariffs throughout the CPA, uh, space, as well as to be more competitive than our utility. We wanted to clearly illustrate the value of SDCP to our customers. We wanted to close that generation build credit gap um, and reduce that payback period. So that was really important for us. Um, so because it makes the adoption more financially attractive uh, for our customers, uh, and in doing so, also address and promote equity for our low-income care fair customers. At the same time, we wanted to ensure simplicity in the adders. We didn't want to make it a complicated thing that the CPC adopted um, while simultaneously also supporting grid. So us trying to balance all of these, ad, uh, these goals to make sure that we came out with the most customer-centric and competitive um, tariff available on the market. Um, and with that, if we go to the next slide, um, what we are proposing is an adder uh, for all customers um, of a a three quarters of a cent uh, for all customers, including commercial customers, which were excluded by the PUC. Um, so that would be provided uh, for six years for all new customers that install generation, uh, new generation in the next three years. Uh, the reason we set it at six years is that we use the PUC's own tool, its own calculator uh, that they use to establish the adders to figure out what level of adder would get us to have it be on parity across customer classes, whether they were uh, care or non-care. So with that in mind, we're saying three quarters of a, of a cent for all customers and then 11 cents for care and fair customers. What that does is it brings the payback period to be just around six years. Of course, this is an average, right? We're Customers have different financing needs and can have different um, incentives uh, on that. But overall, we wanted to say six years for customers. And so that, that is why we're proposing these efforts. OK, now we're going into the last piece, which is on net surplus compensation. Um, if we go to the next slide. So one of the, um, the other things that change as part of MBT um, is that uh, in establishing the, the the new tariff, the utilities argued um, that they needed to do an adjustment, that they needed authorization to do an adjustment for uh, a process for how they compensate customers at the end of their true up for energy that they exported, excess energy that they exported to the grid. 
Um, they contend that because they were already paying avoided cost calculator rates once to generate bill credits, paying the NSC rate, which is essentially the same as the avoided cost calculator now, would be a double payment. Um, and so we we kind of took a look at that, and um, thank you to Lucas for flagging that. And we we were just like, that's not a very customer centric way of looking at things, right? Because one, we kind of see the true up as really the point in time that that really demarcates where billing credits are associated, and then where excess energy annual excess energy gets uh, compensated. Um, and so what we're proposing is simple: let's not do that adjustment. Um, so what our what our tariff stipulates is that we would not be implementing any kind of adjustments if you so uh, choose to adopt. Um, and what that means is that uh, customers will receive the whole value of their net surplus compensation. Our team looked at what that uh, value would look like um, in terms of net surplus compensations for the next set of customers that we get a new generation. Um, and we estimate that we would see payments uh, for net surplus compensation of 3.2 million over the next three years. Um, and that is true regardless of whether we adopt MBT or we don't. So that was one of the reasons why we didn't include it in, in that graph that you saw earlier. Um, as stipulated currently and, and is uh, available to our customers, um, they MBT customers would follow the same standard net surplus compensation process where a check is automatically issued to them if their payment amount is $100 or more. Um, otherwise, we just put that credit onto the next billing system. And that is true for NEM customers now, and we want to continue that um, for MBT customers going forward. And so with that, I want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, stakeholder engagement um, that we did. So, um, well, it does not show up fully here, um, because there's three columns uh, that are supposed to be in this uh, slide. Um, <laughs> But we did broad outreach um, to really try and solicit feedback from across uh, the industry. So you'll see all, a few of the names here, but we really uh, started talking to the California Solar uh, and Storage Association to understand um, whether we were on the right track with this proposal. Um, we talked to the Climate Action Campaign with Great Alternatives, um, with IEDW, with our local chambers of commerce, um, with the Utility Consumers Action Network, an uh, advocacy group for ratepayers, um, with Vote Solar, um, and for the Solar Energy Industries Association, um, with Baker Electric installers, one of the big installers in our region, as well as with Clean Tech San Diego, um, who convened their energy working group to kind of suss out this uh, this proposal and see did does it make sense? Um, and uh, what they ended up saying is it does. Uh, we got some compliments from some of the solar industry saying like, you guys are the ones who are actually thinking of our customers, right? Great Alternatives was really kind and you'll see that in the letters that of support that you received. Um, Great Alternatives was one that told us like, you are thinking about our low income customers in the tariff, right? They're not a second, uh, a second afterthought. I do wanna mention here that uh, you received letters of support from a number of uh, the, the stakeholders in here um, we missed one, which was Clean Tech San Diego, did submit a letter of support as well. Um, and that will be uploaded to our website and we can send it to you as well um, following this meeting. Um, but that uh, we did receive uh, letters of support for that. And with that, I want to uh, move it over, uh, give it over to uh, Colin to talk about this battery energy storage pilot program. Because one of the things that we found as we were going through this extensive process is that Installing storage along with your solar system significantly reduces your payback period even more. Um, and so I wanna uh, pass it over to Colin and talk about that. Thank you, Noah. This will be brief. It's a, a bit of a tangent from the tariff that you're being asked to consider, but we wanted to be transparent in our thinking and we really did think about this uh, storage program alongside NBT. And so when we were considering them, we were them together, so that's why we're presenting at least some, uh, some a little bit of uh, information at this point. Uh, so like Nelson said, MBT, the tariff is designed to incentivize with price signals uh, the installation of storage, but storage is still inexpensive and it, it can be out of reach for many of our customers. So we are proposing to develop uh, an incentive pilot that, or an incentive program 
that uh, likely will have both upfront incentives as well as some performance incentives to provide the most value we can to our customers to who add storage to their on-site generation. We are in the middle of industry engagement now. We hired a, a full-time staff member to at least initially focus on this. Uh, not uh, many of our staff focus on just one thing. And that we, uh, I think that shows how emblematic um, it is our, our focus on this program specifically. We are committed to come back to the advisory committee and the board of directors in Q1 of 2024 to give an update. Uh, so what we are we are hoping that we uh, have a robust up, update and we're hoping for a launch early in 2024 program um, with uh, depending on the feedback we receive from stakeholders in the board. And with that, we will wrap up the item. Uh, well, thank you, Nelson and Colin. Uh, very detailed, but very complete uh, presentation. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, Kimberly, do we have any public comment on this item? Um, yes, Serena Pilka. Serena, you have three minutes. Hello, this is Serena Polka from Climate Action Campaign. I'm calling in to express our support for the adoption of the net billing tariff for new customers. In order to reach the zero carbon future that our communities need and deserve, it's essential that we work to expand rooftop solar and battery storage across the region. These are critical tools for community, climate, and grid resiliency, and the NBT will support their incentivization and growth. NBT will also strengthen the ability for customers throughout the region to generate and access their own clean power. We specifically want to applaud SDCP's ongoing actions to prioritize investments in communities of concern, as is really exemplified through the higher adders and the shorter payback periods. And we really appreciate the thoughtful considerations to reach today's recommendation. So thank you so much to SDCP staff and leadership for your ongoing community engagement, your commitment to equity, and your uh, genuine customer-centric approach. So uh, please support the approval of this item and, and we appreciate it. There are no additional, additional comments. comments. Okay, and I'll just add um, to emphasize what Nelson already said, we did get letters in support by a climate action campaign, great alternatives, vote solar, Baker Home Energy, Solar Energy Industries Association and Clean Tech uh, on this going forward. Um, and before we move on to members, I believe the our advisory committee also supported this item. Yes, yeah, we presented to the advisory committee at their regularly scheduled um, October twelfth meeting, and they did uh, support this. Okay, applaud it. Applaud And we did also present to the FRC, and they also uh, approved or moved to recommend approval. Okay. So with that, we'll turn it over to the board members for comments, and this one does require a motion. Board members would like to jump in, here or remote. You go ahead. No, um, uh, Mr. Chair, if uh, there's no comments by the board, I'd be happy to make the motion. Okay, I'll have a few comments, but okay. Okay, Mayor uh, Member Hansen. Yeah, I'll just say that I know we were a little bit nervous leading up to this discussion about what we would have to give and what we would take. And it seems, you know, it's a really complicated formula we have here. I think we've all done our best to understand it, but it's really positive that we don't have any letters of opposition and that, in fact, we have support for it. So I feel really confident and I'll second the motion and look forward to Chair Lacava's comments. Okay. Well, just a few comments. An awful lot of work that deserves a little bit. <laughs> uh, but we do want to thank you uh, and everybody that worked on this. Uh, as member Henzie said, I remember when I first heard about it, a little bit nervous, but you all done remarkable work and very thoughtful work and really uh, amplified the customer centric uh, that has been a key part of community power since its uh, foundation. And then engaging the community and doing stakeholder outreach. Uh, and listening and building in what their perspective was is so key. Um, and it, it's, it's been a tough conversation. The CPC has been in a lot of different directions. The IOUs have had their own thoughts about how NEM should be reimagined and revisited. And I appreciate that you considered that, but figured out the path that we wanted to take. Uh, and as member, as he said, it is also remarkable that 
No, that's not the right way to say it. It is remarkable that it is an awful. It is remarkable uh, that you get such letters of support. Um, in and how, as an organization, how will we revisit if the board approves this and the next item? Do we look at this annually, or how often will we look revisit this item? Yeah, that, thank you for bringing that. That's one thing that I forgot to mention under the generation matters. The reason we set them for the next installations that happen in the next three years is because we want to make do an evaluation of those satters to make sure that they're accomplishing the goals that we initially had set out. And so what we want to do is in year three is start an evaluation process of those adders and then come back to the board with any adjustments to those adders um, that are needed. Uh, whether we continue them, discontinue them, lower them, we increase them as up to the board at the time um, to decide. Okay, thank you for that clarification. All right, with that, we do have a by member Ken and a second by member Kinsey. Uh, Kimberly, please call the roll. Director Aguirre, how do you vote? Yes. Director Hinsey, how do you vote? Yes. Director McCann, how do you vote? Aye. Director Shu, how do you vote? Aye. Director Yamani, how do you vote? Aye. Vice Chair Lawson Reamer, how do you vote? Aye. Chair LaCava, how do you vote? Aye. Motion carries with all directors voting yes. Really? Again, thank you for your very good, good work. Uh, so now we'll move on to item 17. Approval of update to the existing net energy NAM tariff. And I believe I'll turn it over to Lucas and Nelson will stay on board. This one's only a five minute presentation. So <laughs> moving right along. Indeed. Good Chair LaCava and board of directors. Um, so my presentation today on the Dolphin consists of just one slide. <laughs> um, so consistent with always keeping our customers as the cornerstone of everything that we do as an organization. Uh, and in the spirit of offering a world class customer experience to the customers, um, staff has reviewed the existing net energy metering policy uh, based on overwhelming feedback that we've received from our customers through our product center and through in person interactions through the various um, events that we attend. And we would on we would like to the <laughs> board that we make adjustments to our existing policy by removing the $2,500 net surplus compensation limit. And we believe that to be um, an impediment to us essentially, you know, leaving our mission of valuing and sourcing local renewable energy. Um, I think the, the, the limit back then made sense because we were relatively young with, with, without any you know, without any reserves, but now we are in a stronger financial position as evidenced by uh, the audit report that you got or that you will receive um, next month. Uh, we also believe that the adoption of a NEM generation credit refund will definitely greatly enhance customer experience um, as it relates to our default monthly billing option. Uh, I just wanted to point to the board that, you know, we do offer two options. Directly, which is default and annual, which customers can elect to uh, sign up for on our website. And we believe that, you know, through the overwhelming feedback that we've received from our customers, that uh, adopting perhaps these two enhancements to our existing NEM policy that serves in excess of 155,000 NEM customers is definitely the right way to go. And now is definitely the right time for those updates. So with that, um, it de definitely concludes my presentation. I'm um, happy to take any questions, comments, or additional feedback. Okay, thank you, Lucas. Uh, Kimberly, do we have any public comment on this item? No, we do not. All right. So I'll turn this over to the board uh, for comments, and we also require a motion on this. Mayor McCann? Have a second. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, with that, I think you did you make a motion? Yeah, 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 I was gonna I just wanted to say this is Ryden's um action to remove that uh, cap and it it uh, has the right incentive. So I will make the motion. So moved. All right. So we have a motion by Member McCann and a second by our vice chair. Um I'm old enough to remember, I think, when we put in the 2500 because we were very nervous about 
how customers could take advantage of that. And when uh, we were starting up, it was a little bit scary, but uh, I appreciate you trying to do these kinds of things. Uh, and remembering now that we have matured and our reserves have built, now's the time to kind of remove that. So we don't negatively impact of larger customers. So with that, uh, again, we have a motion by member McCann and a second by our vice chair. Uh, Kimberly, please call the roll. Director Aguirre, how do you vote? Yes. Director Hinsey, how do you vote? Yes. Director McCann, how do you vote? Aye. Director Shu, how do you vote? Aye. Director Yamani, how do you vote? Aye. Vice Chair Lawson Reamer, how do you vote? Aye. Chair LaCava, how do you vote? Yes. Motion carries with all directors voting yes. All right, now we'll move on to item 18. This is an update on our local distributed infill plan. I'll turn it over to Morgan Adam to present this item um, about to 15 minutes. Thank you, Chair Lacava. Good evening, board. Um, well, it's been a few months since I last addressed the board um, at a strategic planning session back in April. And as I promised then, uh, I'm back now to present an update to a local distributed infill plan. Um, just as a reminder to everyone here, uh, among the goals that SDCP has set for 2035, one of them is to serve uh, at least 15% of our load by new infill resources, uh, either distinct from the utility scale transmission level procurement uh, that we're already engaged in. Um, I don't think I need to, to read off many of the reasons why SDCP and the board are focused on and have these specific distributed uh, infill goals, but Suffice it to say that the um, benefits are many, and I'm excited to get to work on, uh, focus a lot of my time on steering the agency toward meeting these goals. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so luckily, our services team, uh, we're not tackling this alone. Um, there are a lot of cross-departmental DER initiatives uh, that we'll continue to partner with, um, partner on with our customer programs team, some of which you've heard about tonight from um, Colin and uh, a lot of uh, folks on the programs team. And, and this list uh, certainly isn't exhaustive either. Um, and I wanted to include this slide to illustrate the breadth of DERs that we're working on uh, between our two departments um, and which achieve many of the same objectives and uh, many of the same benefits flow down to our customers and to our member agencies um, in similar ways. So. Um, but what I'm here to update the board on tonight is the is the left circle you see there, uh, the wholesale distributed uh, resource procurement, separate from the you know customer programs side of it. Um, there are there are multiple pillars uh, supporting um, our infill procurement, including solicitations. Uh, we have our local RFI. We have the Solar for Our Communities uh, program and other other targeted RFOs, um, including a brand new uh, a brand new one that I'll address a little bit later in this presentation. Um, we have our feed-in tariff, which is essentially a wholesale procurement contract. And then finally, uh, community solar, uh, which I won't go into a ton of detail here tonight, but I will note that the CPUC is currently contemplating a holistic restructuring of community solar in the state. And uh, we should be hearing from the CPC uh, later this fall as to what that will entail. So we can forward to digging into that. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> okay, so this is this is a, a further breakdown of our wholesale uh, distributed procurement initiatives that we're focusing on over the uh, next few months. Uh, the light pink uh, activities here are already in full flight. Um, you know, really comprised of solicitations mainly. Um, and the dark colored items are initiatives that are ongoing, uh, meaning to say that, you know, we're still uh, under the hood and have plans to get those up and running in the first half of, of next year. Those consist of um, expanding our feed-in tariff um, program, as well as getting an initial tranche of uh, member agency sites teed up for removal development um, in uh, Q2. Uh, um, there's one aspect of this uh, uh, of this loading order that I wanted to call out specifically. Um, during our April strategic session, the expectation at the time you know, really was that we were gonna focus on member agency site development as the first priority 
um, followed by the private industry um, sites. We've uh, since gotten a lot of enthusiastic responses from renewable developers, um, and that engagement um, with industry has really led us, uh, has really made it clear to us that uh, we need to enable the private projects in parallel to the work that we're doing uh, with the member agency staffs, um, rather just in series. So we kind of work to um, set private industry loose um, on some of those. Um, so we'll dive into each of these a bit more um, during, in, the, in the following slides. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so just to touch on some of the uh, wholesale procurement uh, successes that we have. Um, uh, we have our longstanding local RFI, uh, which is rolling, and uh, that you know that's inclusive of both utility scale and distributed projects. Um, on the distributed infill side, it's brought in the recent um, EnterSmart deals that the board here has uh, been reviewing over the past couple months, and which will deliver over 19 megawatt of much needed local delay across six sites in San Diego County. Um, in addition to those, we have a lot of other opportunities that uh, have been brought through the RFI that are uh, currently under negotiation. Um, and then again, we have our solar for, for communities, green tariffs. Um, that's our name for the DAC GT and CSGT CPUC programs that uh, Tessa with our programs team is managing. Um, the first round of that application was released uh, back in August and responses are uh, due in February. So we're looking forward to see uh, what those might yield. Uh, next slide, please. So we're excited to say that we have a brand new solicitation um, on the street as of this week. Um, it's an RFO specifically targeting uh, these distributed wholesale opportunities. Um, this this RFO it'll it will is intended to cast a wide net for distributed infill projects, uh, ranging from 100 kilowatts to 10 megawatts in size, um, all distribution interconnected, all located in San Diego County. Um, and will include, you know, essentially any combination of renewable generation and energy storage. <clears throat> uh, responses will be due in approximately 60 days. We'll shortlist an award in January. Um, we hope to bring some projects to the board for consideration later in Q1. Um, I, I can say I personally know and have spoken with um, a number of developers who are waiting in the wings and eager to respond to the solicitation. Um, and I think we can expect a good number, a good number of responses um, coming out of this. Um, so please you know, help spread the message far and wide. Um, the solicitation is live on our solicitations page on our website. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, just wanted to touch on some of the initiatives that we're continuing to work in parallel. Um, as we work to get the you know private industry gears turning, um, our feed-in tariff program, um, as I mentioned, um, we are hoping to expand that current program. You know, really to to capture more projects. Um, I think those um, those changes will include scope, uh, sizing, you know, uh, pricing, et cetera. Um, and because of how we've sequenced these. Uh, we'll have the benefit of the recent RFO pricing to help inform our feed-in tariff uh, redesign for the next year. So looking forward to bringing some recommendations to the board um, in Q1. And then in terms of member agency site development, we've had a lot of great discussions with all the member agencies and their staff. Um, we'll continue to stay engaged on that front. Um, I'll say I think we've realized it's inherently um, a bit slower and more complicated since it, since it involves the use of, of public land. Um, but with staff assistance, we are compiling a list of member agency sites for potential development. Um, and we'll continue to develop and hone uh, that site list over the coming months as we work in parallel to get um, the new RFO and be in care of this improved. Um, and we expect you two of next year to be a reasonable time frame to uh, get our first tranche of sites together. Um, that'll probably include uh, solar and or uh, standalone storage projects. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So uh, nothing new on this slide. I just wanted to um, end with it, with a recap of the wholesale 
um, DERs that we're focusing on over the coming months. Um, we feel that it's a it's a robust and uh, diversified strategy, and will really set a strong foundation um, for future work as we grow and markets and energy landscapes evolve around us. Thanks for seeing my presentation. Okay. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, Emily, do we have any public comment? There is no public comment. All right, turn it over to the board. This is a receive and file, which we do unless there's objection. And we'll go first to our vice chair. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm obviously incredibly excited about this. It looks like you've made just incredible progress. And I, I, I think it's really, um, it's a testament to the focus. And when, I really appreciate that. Uh, we as a board, in a way, we have the easy job. We set the goal, um, and then you have the hard job of really figuring out how to how to make that happen. So I'm just so grateful for all the work. Um, I was actually just curious about some of what you were talking about. You were just talking about how you decided you kind of got to do the commercial um, alongside um, the the big partner agencies, um, and that was because you were you said that there's been a lot of interest. So. I just want to know more, you know, what, what's been unfolding in terms of these conversations, what kind of entities are interested and excited, yeah. why do you think they are, you know, just wanted to get a better sense of what's going on. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for saying that, for sure. Um, I, you know, we've, um, I think that um, a lot of industry, I've been, you know, a lot of the companies that would be building these infill projects, the companies that kind of do the medium scale um, community solar projects. Um, so, so most of those companies are are highly active in other markets and other states that have you know really um, sort of mature community solar programs. Here in California, um, it's uh, our our community solar programs are still new and evolving. Like I said, there's there's new um, program guidance coming out of the CPC in the coming months. So, um, frankly, you know, a good number of developers have kind of like. You know, Put California on like tier two, tier two priority list, and so as I've been reaching out and telling them, hey, we've got these like really aggressive infill goals. We're like we're we're really taking it seriously. So they've just been like really excited by that, and um, a lot of them have been already you know they've already been kind of teeing up um, uh, potential projects and property, trying to tie up tie up land just for the possibility that in the future we'll have a robust community solar program in the state. And they're like, great, I, I'm I'm ready to go now. You know, like let you know. Um, I think they're just really excited to kind of have like a home in San Diego County where they can develop these medium, medium sized uh, projects that, um, you know, to date, that's not as been as much of a focus for some of the other low serving entities or CCAs in the state. So that's super helpful. Not, I don't, I would, I'd love like an illustrative example of the kind of pro, like the kind of scale or kind of projects they're, they're able to do or they're looking at doing. Um, on, so, uh, so all everything under the sun. Um, <laughs> no point intended. Um, <laughs> a lot of people saying that they're working with large warehouses or REITs. They've got like large, large rooftops that that you know that you know large portfolios of customers that you know they've been engaged with the REITs and they want to like have an office. The, the REITs. Yeah, the REITs. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a big that one. That makes sense. Yep. Um, and then um, other folks have found little parcels of land. You know, small you know, previously, you know, developed land that they can put uh, one or two megawatts of, of projects and, and interconnect to. So, and then some others have some parking lots that they're interested in developing too. So um, I'd say the majority has been kind of like um, rooftops in the, you know, under megawatt, maybe one or two megawatt scales. Um, but a lot of them have like, hey, I want to send a portfolio. So I have like, each rooftop might only be a 500 kilowatts, but I've got 20 of them um, and, you know, I can do some portfolio pricing because it's, you know, single financing. I mean, I, I'm just so excited because this is like literally the whole point of, you know, if, you know, if we have the demand that there is supply there, but we have to, we have to have demand in order for that to be here in um, California. So just, uh, that's just really exciting news. And any thought on how long until there might be a project that, um, it's in the ground and that's still any kind You're not of... going to hold me to that, right? No, <laughs> it's an estimate. Curious. Um, I would say, I mean, if we can get um, some projects um, under contract in the first half of next year, I mean, maybe 
a year after that, especially if they already have things in a connection to you. Maybe if they haven't really started in a connection process, you know, it might realistically it's probably two years, but um, I've talked to some folks that do have projects that are already in queue. So they're kind of ready to go. It's great. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just, I'm very excited. So great work. It's, and do I make a motion? We don't need a motion. <laughs> Any other comments? Uh, thank you, Morgan, for the very good work um, and the progress that you've made. Clearly, we've learned a lot about state of the art and this kind of thing. Uh, but I also want to take a moment to thank our vice chair, Lawson Reamer. Uh, she was really a guiding voice on this conversation in 2022 and helped the board pivot in our strategic plan. So thank you for that. Um, uh, and then Morgan, for your follow up and everybody that's working on it. Yeah, you know, like you said, like the uh, vice chair said, I think we're very excited about adding this to our portfolio and seeing what's possible. Um, you talk about the member agencies role in this. Um, what can we do um, as representatives from our member agency uh, in assisting you in this process? Yeah, um, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, everyone's staff has been extremely helpful, um, and um, I think um, you know just continuing to sort of probe staff um, to um, that. You know, there's there's also some I'll note there are some sort of structural obstacles that we've we've all encountered as we've sort of you know thought about how we can. You know, utilize member agency property. Um, there's a surplus land act and certain complications around that. Um, and so, um, I think that it's just uh, it's a process that that you know we need to continue to work on together. And so, um, yeah, just making your staff available to continue these conversations um, would be great. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you very much again. Uh, if there's no objection, we'll just simply receive and file the update. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you. Moving along, we're on item 19. This is one of two uh, power agreements. This one is the approval of the next era desert sand standalone storage energy storage services agreement. It's a mouthful. And, it's a mouthful. <laughs> and I will turn over to Andrea Torres to present this item. That's about eight minutes or so. Yeah. Okay. When you're ready. Thank you, Chair Lecoffin, Board of Directors. Um, yeah, I'm here to present our recommendation for the approval of this 20 year energy storage service agreement with uh, Desert Sands Energy Storage, a, a subsidiary of uh, our next era. Um, the, in May, of, of April of this year, uh, SDC issued an RFO on um, to um, secure stand uh, contracts for standalone storage projects. Um, these types of assets provide capacity, energy arbitrage, and ancillary service benefits for load-serving entities like SDCP. Uh, we were fortunate to receive a robust uh, response of offers, uh, primarily for lithium-ion battery storage of various um, capacities and, and duration capabilities. Uh, Nextera's Desert Sands Energy Storage Project was among those shortlisted for negotiations by staff in consultation with the Energy Contracts Working Group, and we use the uh, Energy Project Evaluation Criteria, or EPEC criteria, for that selection process. You may recall that's a combination of um, a quantitative analysis of the project's value for a portfolio but also other qualitative criteria around workforce development, uh, projects location, um, environmental attributes, um, and uh, community um, engagement, community benefits. Next slide, please. So the Desert Sands Energy Storage Project um, that we are, the portion we're contracting for is for 60 megawatts or 480 megawatt hours or an eight hour duration lithium ion battery storage system. It's located in Palm Springs in Riverside County. On the map here in the red indicator, you'll see um, where the project is intended to be constructed. And you'll see it's just west of North Palm Springs. Um, you will see wind tur turbines in the, the area um, as well on this map. And so it's a previously uh, disturbed land that the project will be sited on. It is part of a portion of a larger energy complex by Nextera. Um, for example, uh, our fellow CCA uh, Clean Power Alliance has executed a contract not too long ago for 75 megawatts 
um, of this, this, this same installation. Next slide, please. So the product being contracted for, we call them full pole. That's where um, they they own and operate the battery, but we are we are we are um, submitting. Um, we're dispatching it to the grid. We're deciding when to charge it, um, charge energy from the grid, um, and in addition to that, sort of services around those energy arbitrage and ancillary services will also receive key um, capacity benefits. What's called resource adequacy. It's really important for our portfolio. Uh, pricing is is fixed capacity pricing adjusted for tested effective capacity at least every year, um, as well as a measurement of availability, how available it is to us on a monthly basis over a 20 year term. Uh, the timeline here is a guaranteed commercial operation date in April of 2027. And uh, as with many of our contracts, SPCP would seek receive financial compensation for um, failure to meet certain contractual requirements, including requirements to achieve certain development milestones, um, and then also to um, perform the battery, uh, get, uh, meet its guaranteed route trip efficiency rates over the delivery term to make sure that we're getting most value from these projects throughout the term. Next slide. So with the full capacity deliverability status, um, that's a key um, status for any project to provide resource adequacy. Um, this project with a high probability to attain that status as well as a guarantee of commercial operations in 2027 means that this project would fulfill our long duration energy storage uh, midterm reliability or MTR requirements by the CPUC. Um, the pricing is, is competitive with comparable product offerings for long duration storage, in this case, eight hour batteries. Um, the long duration storage um, will provide increased grid resiliency and reliability for our customers. Um, Nextera is a global leader in renewable and um, storage development with over five gigawatts developed in California. So that was a, a part of our selection criteria as well, that developer experience that really did bring you online as promised. Next slide. So Nextera is committed to making a little, a little bit of information on workforce development and community benefits. Um, they're committed to making a, a donation <laughs> contribution of $250,000 to a future community benefit fund that's to be established to directly benefit stakeholders in our service area. Um, the entirety of the Desert Seeds project, I mentioned we're, we're off take of a portion of it, will provide over 200 construction jobs for which Nextera is committed to um, having be constructed by union labor. Um, and then some additional programmatic um, work that, that Nextera does in the region. They host uh, renewable energy training programs. Um, they collab have a collaborative partnership with local uh, colleges for helping to train students in the future workforce for solar construction. And they also have an established internship program at their, at their org that creates long term <laughs> career opportunities. Um, this concludes my presentation for this project, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for the presentation and all the work and every, all the work by Tower Services team. Uh, Kimberly, do we have any public comment? There's no public comment. All right, so now I'll turn it over to the board members for comments, and this one does require a motion. And uh, member two. Yeah. Um, Andrew, I'm uh, curious about um, the, the workforce training aspect, and that's part of the criteria to, to review these projects, and as well as uh, unionizing and workers' rights. What kind of assurance do we have that five years from now, 10 years from now, those things are still in place. Uh, is that part of the agreement and contract? We do have a component of the agreement where they're committing to union labor for the project under a workforce um, agreement with labor. I do know that the uh, Nextera as a whole is working on a more holistic package for their whole portfolio with unions, with IBEW specifically. Um, so that was a key component, just understanding that they have a great track record of having sort of project labor agreements with all of their 
um, you know, similar projects we talked about. You know, I, I came to you previously for the Yellow Pine um, project approval. Um, so this should be no different than that. So that would be like a state approved apprenticeship programs, um, specify things like that. Yeah, and, and apprenticeship programs are a key portion of the Inflation Reduction Act tax benefits that projects get. So thankfully, um, that is the is a built in um, incentive there to, to provide that type of. Right, thank you. And this, so I don't have to ask the question again, would that be also true for M20? Next time. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. Thank I can you. talk a little bit more detail about their approach for okay, that, thank that you. Next project as well. Um, we will need a motion on this item. I'll move. Okay. I'll move. Number two. Second. Yeah, member. Yeah. And I'll add that this was heard by the energy contracts. Uh, Mayor McCann and I attended it. <clears throat> also supported, or at least had no objection to it at that time. So with that, uh, we have a motion by member Shu and a second by member McCann to move the staff recommendation. Kimberly, please call the roll. Director Aguirre, how do you vote? Yes. Director Hinsey, how do you vote? Yes. Director McCann, how do you vote? Aye. Director Shu, how do you vote? Aye. Director Yamani, how do you vote? Aye. Vice Chair Lawson Reamer, how do you vote? Aye. Chair LaCava, how do you vote? Yes. Motion carries with all directors voting yes. Okay. On to item 20, uh, the approval of the pattern Sanzia purchase agreement. And again, we'll turn it over to Andrea to present this item and eight minute staff presentation. Yep, not less. Yeah, if not less. <laughs> I know the, the last act here. Um, so, yes, we. Um, I'm here to present a recommendation for approval of this contract um, with pattern energy for the Sanzia wind project. Um, uh, about a year ago, we issued an RFP for um, offerings of renewables or renewables paired with storage projects. Um, we received a variety of offers at that time for solar, wind, and battery access. <coughs> um, Pattern Energy's Sunzia Wind Project was among those shortlisted for negotiations by staff in consultation, in consultation with the Energy Contracts Working Group and we've been providing them with regular updates on the progress of our negotiations um, throughout this time frame. Next slide. Um, so the Sunzia Wind Project is quite a large project. You may have heard about it. Uh, that it comes with a, a pattern building out a very large transmission line as well to help connect that power, that wind power um, to help service um, other parts of the country, including California. Um, this is for a small portion of that larger project, so 150 megawatts of wind from approximately 3.5 gigawatts of the Sun Wind Project. Due to its size, the footprint of the, the project covers um, three counties in New Mexico, including Lincoln, Torrance, and San Miguel counties. And here's a map provided by Pattern as part of their, their offering to us, just to explain to demonstrate the higher quality wind resources that are in that region and the reason why they are citing that project for development there. Um, the product contract for is pretty standard uh, where we are um, contracting for the energy provided from the facility as well as the portfolio content um, one Rex, and those same capacity uh, benefits of resource adequacy. The contract is for fixed pricing for per megawatt hour of delivery to SDCP. The timeline for, um, for this project has expectations of a commercial operation date in March of 2026. And as with a lot of other contracts, they we receive financial compensation for in the event they don't meet certain development milestones or they fail to deliver a minimum quantity of megawatt hours per year. Next slide. So the pricing is is was is and was competitive with um, product offerings received um, through the RFO for wind generation. Wind generation in particular, we do want to diversify our portfolio. Um, we get a lot of offerings for um, solar and and um, storage, and wind also needs to be part of our our portfolio. 
It provides uh, the sort of complementary generation to a lot of that, that, that standard solar PV wind profile, both on a daily and seasonal time frame. The project will contribute toward our those midterm reliability requirements, as I mentioned earlier. The uh, pattern also has a long track record of experience in developing renewables, um, including 367 megawatts of wind generation in California and placing more than six gigawatts of wind and solar projects into service worldwide. Um, the workforce and community benefits, um, workforce development community benefits for this project is the that's a quite a large project. And so the entire installation is expected to provide over 2000 construction jobs. There's also an O&M component jobs I didn't list here on the order, I think it was 150 long-term um, operations and maintenance jobs post operations. Um, Pattern provides $50,000 annually to the local landowner association to provide scholarships to students. They, they support uh, the Region 9 Educational Cooperative through a grant match program for technical training for wind and solar development. Um, they, we also received, they, they shared with us letters of support that was part of the board packet from IBEW International President and from the New Mexico Building Construction and Trades Council. Um, and I also just wanted to point out, especially coming on the heels of Morgan's uh, work for local infill, that although this is an out-of-state project, this the deliveries expected from this project represent a small portion of our overall portfolio, and this does not preclude anything we're doing under those efforts to um, ensure that local development part of our portfolio and those concerted efforts we're doing there. Um, that concludes my presentation on the Sanzia project. Just you know, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Uh, thank you, Andrea. And thank you to everybody in the Power Services team uh, for bringing this project forward. This was also heard by the Energy Contract mm -hmm. uh, Working Group. Uh, Kimberly, do we have any public comment? There's no public comment. All right. So I'll turn it over to the board. And again, for any comments or questions, and this does require a motion as well. Member Hinson. Yeah, I had a question about the scholarships, for example. So these benefits that we get through these agreements are really wonderful. And I'm, I know they're written out in a contract form. So there's a requirement that they actually do it. But um, do you know anything about the oversight of the scholarships? Like, how can we make sure that it's a well-run program? And is that even something that we have purview over? Yeah, so the, the specific scholarships and other efforts that Pattern and NextEra are doing are part of their portfolio view of their work within their communities um, that they do business in. The, the fund that we're, um, sorry, this is related to NextEra, we have a community benefit fund that we're working on that will future have a future rollout. Those contributions that we're securing for a number of our negotiations with projects would be not really coming into effect until the projects achieve commercial operations and in 2025, 2026, we have time to design that, that initiative. As far as their performance under their existing um, efforts for workforce development and um, educational opportunities, we're relying um, on the developer history of those programs um, we may ask questions about their efforts and their future plans, um, but those types of efforts are considered sort of on a qualitative basis during the uh, selection criteria, but we don't have um, certain like benchmarks or requirements for those pre-existing programs into our, our power purchase agreement, as an example. Well, I, th I think it's great that we have this opportunity, especially with the resource adequacy um, we need to make sure we have ample supply. So I'll move approval. And I think one of the reasons why it's great to have local projects is because it's easier for us to sort of see the benefits in the community, but this sounds great and committees reviewed it and is um, recommending it. So I'll move approval. Okay, uh, motion for member Hinzey. Oh, Second, Mr. Chairman. That was uh, member you mind. Thank you for jumping in rather forcefully so I can catch that. So uh, again, thank you uh, and the uh, Power Services team for bringing this forward. 
and clarifying how this fits into our overall portfolio. And thank you, Member Hinzi, for that community benefits are so exciting, but you got to make sure they're actually delivered. So, um, so with that, we have a motion by Member Hinzi and a second by Member Yavani to move the staff recommendation. Um, Kimberly, please call the vote. Director Geary, how do you vote? Yes. Director Hinzi, how do you vote? Yes. Director McCann, how do you vote? Aye. Director Shu, how do you vote? Aye. Director Yamani, how do you vote? Aye. Vice Chair Lawson Reamer, how do you vote? Aye. Chair LaCava, how do you vote? Aye. The motion carries with all directors voting yes. All right, terrific. Thank you. And thank you to all the staff. Bless you. Uh, for all the items. It was a pretty ambitious agenda. Uh, good work. Uh, that made it easier for us to kind of navigate through that and be supportive. So with that, uh, do we have a report tonight from our CEO, Karen Burns? We do. Okay. Next slide, please. I know I'm the one standing between everyone here and their ride home, so I will be quick. But first, and really importantly, I want to give a huge thank you and shout out to our teams. I mean, all of what you saw tonight has been an incredible team effort. So the programs team, customer operations, finance, power, public affairs, really everyone working together, coming together, and just incredible leadership and the leadership of our executive team. So I really want to thank everyone. I'm so proud to work with this team. Um, and we also have a recognition tonight from the Government Finance Officers Association. We, despite being a young organization, nearly three years old, we have received the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award, um, which really demonstrates our commitment to our customers. That includes sound financial management, ensuring that we can provide clean energy at competitive rates for many years to come. Uh, this award recognizes our commitment to fiscal stability and transparency as we continue to build our reserves and serve our customers. So a huge shout out to our finance team, led by Dr. Eric Washington, for all of their hard work. All right, so just a few, a few updates from my end. At the end of September, I was able to connect with the other Cal uh, CCA CEOs in Sonoma, at, in, uh, with, up at the Sonoma Clean Power offices. And we had some great conversation, mapped out some really exciting strategy and met with some of our elected officials uh, up there. Thank you, next slide. We also attended some recent conferences. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at the California Energy Commission's Building Electrification Summit in Sacramento. And they, uh, some manufacturers made a, a really exciting announcement that they'll be working with the CEC uh, the manufacturers and suppliers of heat pumps, both for hot water heaters and heating and cooling equipment to help achieve the state's new goal to install 6 million heat pumps by 2030. It's a very uh, ambitious goal and we're excited to see how we also can support that effort. Also at the summit, our very own uh, newly minted Tim Treadwell was uh, speaking and explaining how SDCP is working towards electrification for all, you can see him up there. And lastly, several of us attended the Clean Tech San Diego's Holding Power. It's an energy storage and clean tech future where we talked about energy innovation in the uh, energy storage space and the potential of batteries to really shape our future. Next slide, please. Lots of engagement by our public affairs team this month as well at Casa Familiar's 50th anniversary celebration at the Environmental Health Coalition's Clean Air Congreso. Uh, we tabled at the Wave Fan Fest, and we also sponsored and volunteered at Beautify Chula Vista's 20th annual uh, community cleanup. Next slide. And uh, we are still hiring. You've met some of our new hires tonight. We have several open positions, and we are onboarding three new employees on November 1st, whom you will get to meet uh, at our next board meeting. Next slide. I think that might be it for me. All right. Turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and the good work that you and the entire team do every day. Uh, does our general counsel have anything to report? I do not, Mr. Chair. Thank you. There's an opportunity, even though I keep calling you members, you're actually directors. Uh, do you have anything to report that would like the rest of the board to know? Okay. Yes. Vice Chair. Um, and I, yeah, this is an item for situational awareness. Um, so there's been a long process uh, kind of 
looking at what some opportunities and options are um, at the county to do with uh, kind of with some evergreen funding um, that we have available. What that means is money that we can't or don't want to just spend. Um, we need it to to renew itself, um, but we do have some some resources available to kind of invest in some in, important um, high priority um, initiatives. So. There, one of the options that's going to be coming to our board for consideration, um, in Jan I think it's in January, it's going to come back, um, coming out of a, a subcommittee that I that I sit on, uh, is to do just to have um, a clean tech, green tech uh, innovation fund. Um, so I think that obviously connects very directly with all of this work. And so I just wanted to put it on, on everyone's radar, but especially staff. Um, you know, as if it, to the extent that that direct, uh, intersects with program development or whatnot, um, it just to track it. And I, I would imagine it'll get some support. I would imagine it will likely pass in some form. I don't know how much money, I don't know how big it is, but it's definitely something to be paying attention to. It's, and it would be uh, to be investing in um, innovative, clean and green um, technology here locally in San Diego County. So. Good news. Not, uh, number two. I just want to make a quick comment. Um, since I haven't been to a board meeting for a while, and uh, so it's to me very uh, rewarding, and, and and I only want to make a a great a, uh, a compliment uh, to all of the work that has been done here at the San Diego Community Power. Just seeing the actions we took today to do things for customers to protect um, free stop solar and moving uh, systems um, to assure that we have renewable energy uh, coming to us uh, uh, and, and dealing with infill uh, systems. I think these are all the things that I um, would not only support, but I'm happy to see that uh, our San Diego community power is moving ahead on. Uh, I think uh, it's really good. This is, this is why we have San Diego community power. So thank you. Well said, Jack. Not seeing any other comment. That will bring us to the end of our regular agenda. And I appreciate everyone's participation. Uh, a slow start. Those who uh, were able to participate remotely, we appreciate your efforts there. The board members uh, for a very long agenda. Uh, and of course, the members of the public and all the amazing community power staff. Just want to take every opportunity to thank you for your very good work and staying with us. I think this is one of our longer meetings. Uh, but we got a lot of good stuff, uh, as uh, Jack mentioned. So we are adjourned to the next regular meeting of the Board of Directors with San Diego Community Power on November 16th, 2023. We are adjourned.